Rick attended his first stamp club meeting in Frederick, Maryland in 2005 and attended his first stamp show at Spring Packs in Springfield, Virginia that same year. He first exhibited what he calls a 10 frame mess at Napex 2012. Today, Rick's Smokey exhibit is a hit at stamp shows, often competing for the most popular distinction. Rick serves on the board of the American Association of Philatelic Exhibitors and the Napex Corporation. He is an active APS certified philatelic judge and also immediate past president of the Hagerstown Stamp Club and the Gravener Chapter of the American First Day Cover Society. He is also the immediate past board chair of the AFDCS. Rick has been collecting Smokey Bear stamps, postcards, and other memorabilia for more than three decades. Today, he will address the Smokey Bear issue of 1984, Scott 2096 exhibit, and occasionally mention the Forest Conservation Stamp of 1958, which was canceled with Smokey Bear's likeness. Thank you for being with us, Rick. It's always great to see you. Thanks, Scott. I'm uh, a little befuddled by all this technology. I am uh, still haven't been able to pull up my PowerPoint, but I will, uh, shall we say, press on. So uh, I wasn't able to pull up my PowerPoint because I'm kind of lost on this uh, technology of Zoom. Um, what I will talk about is um, things that I think some people have seen. Uh, you've already given my intro, which is um, about half my presentation. So um, we'll uh, dispense with that. I will say that the modular airborne firefighting system, which is um, uh, a big part of my career in the Air Force, um, an Air National Guard uh, run by a group of uh, volunteers of Air National Guardsmen and Air Force Reservists. And it is um, a work of love. We serve as a surge capability for the U.S. Air Force uh, for the U.S. Forest Service when they need it on mainly the Western wildland firefighting. Uh, I have taken the aircraft uh, across the Pacific and across the Atlantic to Turkey and to Indonesia at different times where we had fires going on over there. And uh, Smokey was called upon to uh, preach his message across the, around the world, basically. Um, uh, so much of what you've already talked about, I'm uh, um, a novice at this, and I'm a little afraid of uh, being here in front of so many experienced philatelists. They are, uh, uh, having begun in 2005, it was, uh, I've come a long way, I think, in that few years. Um, my first exhibit was, uh, as you mentioned, uh, kind of a mess at uh, Napex in 2012. Uh, Janet Klug, great mentors, she uh, ripped my heart out, threw it on the floor, uh, stomped it a little bit, and uh, then taught me and mentored me in trying to get a better exhibit. Um, I just recently, through one of my forest conservation stamps, won the grand at um, Minneapolis, at the Minnesota Stamps Expo. And um, it was a thrill to finally feel like I've reached somewhat of a pinnacle in the uh, exhibiting, but there's so much more to go with so many more exhibits and so many more stamps out there. Um, what I'd like to start with is a little bit of the history is why Smokey Bear? Well, in um, uh, World War II, a Japanese submarine surfaced off the coast of California near a town called Carpinteria, and they have some uh, very, um, there we go. Um, you can see the uh, uh, stuff that was put out during the war time uh, by the Advertising Council to help the kids understand uh, a little bit more about how to prevent fires, et cetera. The problem was that the... Uh, images of Tojo and uh, Hitler were frightening to the kids. So they did away with that and um, went on to working with Walt Disney. And uh, while they were teaching the kids about to the uh, firefighting uh, and how it affected the animals in the forest, et cetera, they, Bambi, the movie, had just come out. So they were... Um, very excited about getting this joint project going with Walt Disney. At the end of the year, Disney um, said, if you want to continue using Bambi in your exhibits or in your um, uh, teaching, uh, you'll have to start paying for him. So it was in, at that time that they began using the, um, are you able to click that up, Scott? There we go. Um, they were able to use Disney 
Bambi, and then uh, they decided, well, we better create our own forest map friendly mascot. And with a stroke of a pen on August 9th, the uh, director of the U.S. Forest Service signed a memo saying that he wanted a bear. Um, next slide, please. He wanted a bear that had a no short uh, and a green pine shorts or pants that, and that was how Smokey came about. Uh, there were a number of artists that have drew, um, drawn Smokey and Smokey was to be a bear in his hind legs, human-like characteristics that they could use in many different ways. Uh, August 9th, 1944, which when the memo was signed and thus they consider that the birthday of Smokey Bear. Uh, you can see on the lower picture in here uh, on the machine cancel that uh, Smokey was a little uh, different than what you may see him today. Um, the small uh, postage stamp uh, label at the left is how Smokey looked uh, when he first came out. That was the first exhibit or uh, poster stamp. Uh, they used this for a number of years. And then if we can go to the next slide. Um, they said they had to convince everyone why we really had to fight these fires. Uh, they were continuing to develop Smokey, but the wartime, August 9th, 1944, they had to get it across to people that lumber was on a part of the ammunition. Um, Battleship had 300,000 board feet of flooring on each deck. Mosquito bombers soon flying over Germany made of wood. Pontoons, 23 million board feet of lumber. 75 foot long PT boats were almost entirely made of wood and a single tree could provide the cellulose for 7,500 rifle cartridges. So it became very uh, important during the wartime to save the trees. Uh, I was able to serve as a military liaison to the National Interagency Fire Center in Boise, Idaho for a number of years. Uh, I ran the command element for the MAPS uh, firefighting element. And um, while up there, I learned that the five agencies that control the fires, uh, control the, ele the elements fighting the fire, each had their own view of why they needed to do it. Um, there were five agencies, the first being the US Forest Service, they needed the lumber, it was produce, and they were uh, being under the um, uh, agriculture, Department of Agriculture. They needed to produce that stuff to uh, let us have it for building and for all these other purposes. The other four agencies were under the Department of Interior. You had the Bureau of Land Management, which has one of the largest uh, management teams to run land across the U.S. and how much land they need for grazing, et cetera, for the cattle. You have the um, Bureau of Indian Affairs, which provides the largest number of contract crews for firefighting every year. You had the Fish and Wildlife, who said, please don't drop the retardant in our streams. And then the last one you had was the uh, National Park. Park Service, which was kind of interesting, is we would go to a meeting in the morning and you might have uh, know that they had a couple of thousand acres under fire. And you say, well, what kind of what kind of assets do you need to fight that fire? And they said, well, we, you know, we're going to let it burn a little bit because it's a natural fire. If they had a fire that was begun by a campfire or a careless camper, then they fought it immediately. But um, basically the uh, attitude of the National Park Service was to let it burn if it's a natural fire. Uh, if there happened to be cabins in there, they felt the cabins could be built back. Next slide, please. Um, after the war, uh, the lumber industry started using Smokey over the years to protect their own assets, and they said they would like to start a campaign to honor Smokey with a stamp. So in 19, early 1958, uh, they came out with the um, this group and the U.S. Forest Service loaned Rudy Wendelin, who was a smoke, uh, who was a uh, uh, graphic artist for the U.S. Forest Service. And he went to that committee and the committee said, well, you know, we're not going to use Smokey. We're going to use um, the uh, other stamp 
the national, which came out in 1958, which was the forest conservation stamp. Uh, once again, uh, Rudy was very amenable to that. He came up with a stamp and uh, you could see on that one slide that Scott had up a minute ago that there were six stamps that Rudy eventually became involved with. Um, of those six stamps, Rudy was designer of five and the co-designer of one. Rudy became the uh, caretaker of Smokey Bear's image over the years. In 1950, they launched a, um, a law, or Congress passed a law, protecting the name and image of Smokey Bear. If you've noticed, I've used the name Smokey Bear. You can go to the next slide, please. If you notice, I've used the name Smokey Bear and not the word T-H-E in the middle of it. Um, I'd like to, I usually answer with, when I hear people say that, that uh, he and John the Baptist are not related. However, um, Rudy worked on this stamp, got the forest conservation, but he did have his input to it, which we'll see in a moment. Uh, currently on the screen are the six stamps that Rudy designed or co-designed. The one at the bottom, 1156, which is the Fifth World Forestry Congress, was the um, uh, one that he co-designed. He did the animals on it. There was actually a designer for the rest of the stamp, a designer for the lettering, and a designer for the numbers at the bottom of it. So um, uh, Rudy, and I have this document, uh, said it was an honor and privilege to have designed the forest conservation stamp. I came across this document. It's a letter that Rudy wrote to a lady who asked uh, how that stamp came about. And it was, uh, uh, I do have that in my exhibit. If we can go to the next slide. So Rudy was able to keep his employers, the U.S. Forest Service happy, and he was able to get his image across. As you notice, there were two uh, die casts for the cancellation on the Smokey, or on the forest conservation stamp, this being one of them, both of which featured Smokey's head on them. So we were able to, through Rudy's efforts, to keep Smokey somewhat involved with the forest conservation stamp. But the forest conservation stamp didn't end with that. Um, different agencies continued to honor, uh, wanting to honor Smokey for the firefighting effort. Smokey Bear is the longest running public service campaign in the United States to this day. A new program comes out every year, normally goes to the, um, um, to the third graders level of most schools, basically, or more importantly, it goes to the West Coast, um, to the Southwest, and to uh, some Minnesota, Pennsylvania, although you do see Smokey's image and his signs and programs that come out across the U.S. every year. A new program every year, a new design. Um, occasionally, they may pull a design from years ago. Um, but they did finally, on its 40th birthday, attempt to issue a Smokey Bear stamp. If we can go to the next image, on Smokey's 75th birthday, I gave a talk on the art and artist of Smokey Bear, and I was able to borrow from the National Postal Museum the original Rudy Wendell artwork for that Smokey Bear stamp. Uh, Dan Piazza, who was our president of the Corporation of Napex, which just had their show, will be having their um, regularly scheduled show in June next year. Um, but... Uh, Dan was able to bring this down to my presentation in uh, for in Frederick, Maryland, and uh, we set up this loan. So that's a uh, photograph of me with the original artwork. Fortunately, I was able to compare that original artwork with a, if we can go to the next image, with a citizen stamp advisory committee, um, number 10 envelope, expertise by the APS, as the only known essay of the Smokey Bear issue, specifically in the public arena. Um, Henry Gittner provided this through uh, one of his shows. I purchased it, I had it expertized, and it is simply a glued on uh, image of the stamp on a number 10 envelope that had a label on the back 
that uh, was from the Citizen Stamp Advisory Committee giving the date in 1982 that it had been approved. Um, the next slide, please, shows that I was able to set side by side the painting that I was holding earlier and the uh, actual stamp and show that there were differences actually between the painting and the stamp through some measurements. The tree limb was moved uh, a little bit to one side um, and a lot of that has to do, well, number one, it was done, I did measurements on his shovel that he holds and the tree and I found that there were actually kind of a elongation um, of his face. There were different differences in the image from the painting and to the final printing, to the etching. Uh, in this, uh, you'll see that the registration is here. Uh, using the offset, the D-Press, uh, which used offset and intaglio printing, they, there were four plates made for each run. Uh, they were used magenta, cyan, yellow, and black, as you do in any four-color printing. But in this case, they made 17 plates for each color. When you go to the uh, Duran book of um, the number of plate of plate numbers, you'll find that there are one 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 one, which would indicate that number one plate of each color was used, and there's 17, 17, 17, 17, indicating that the 17th plate for you. Um, this was the first time that the Bureau of Engraving and Printing had used the D press. And it's estimated that over 80% of the production was actually destroyed. Um, go to the next image, please. Rudy was very upset that uh, the registration on the stamps came out as it did. Uh, I did research at the APRL and found the note that Rudy wrote to columnist C. Belmont Ferries of the Stamp Collector a newspaper about his disappointment and how the registration came about and that the colors of the blue cast, which is kind of a bluish gray, uh, became pale and washed out as the uh, uh, lines in, were etched and they were very amateurish and incomplete. Rudy was not happy with the stamp. Um, if I can go to the next page, please. When I, um, as a new judge, uh, my ex expertise somewhat lies in first day covers. And one of the things I usually ask for first day covers uh, of the collector is that you give me the BIA information, the Bureau of Issues Association, um, Bureau Issues Association. And the BIA information is some of this that you'll see on the plate here. It gives each plate, even though it was one through 17, each of those 17 plates had a plate number assigned to it by the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. Each one of those then had to be accounted for how many times it was run, when it was uh, approved, when it was actually put into use, and then how many stampings went on that. So um, if you're looking for BIA information, there's a couple of different ways you can do it. You can check the Bureau issues, administration, and you can see the um, um, information from their publications, or the Bureau of Engraving and Printing has a file which will send you a page somewhat like this. Uh, you can talk to them about that. Uh, let's go to the next page, please. So examples here of plate 1121, which was one of the original. Now, when you look at plate two broke, our plate three broke. In this case, it happened to be the uh, uh, cy uh, cyan plate. So you have plate one of yellow, plate one of magenta, plate two of cyan, and plate one of black. So as the plates broke, you would have numbers that came up with uh, 1122, uh, 1211, or 12 two, three, et cetera, all the way up to 17, 17, 17, 17. There are 29 recorded plate numbers for the issue. Some of them are supposedly, according to the Duran book on plate numbers, is 
some of them don't exist because they were destroyed and they have no um, of that list of approximately 117 combinations, I have found two that they say didn't exist that I do have. So uh, you can keep checking them. There are some out there. This stamp is known because of its G uh, D press uh, for having uh, lots of errors, uh, lots of different registration problems, as we mentioned earlier. And then after that, Let's go to the next slide. It shows the um, large number of perforation errors that it had. Uh, perforation shifts, uh, lack of perfs, misperfs horizontal, misperfs vertical. Um, uh, the way it was fed into the machine gave it some angle perfs. Um, and these are just a few of the ones that are out there. The one that I went to, um, uh, go to the next one. It will show you the uh, horizontal perforation shift. And lots of different uh, issues there. If you look at the top of the right side of the uh, uh, the single singular stamp or appearing single, uh, you can see the perforations at the top. The measurements are all different because they were fed through the perforation machine twice. So there are some very narrow stamps, some very wide stamps. Um, I just purchased a sheet of those, and uh, Dr. John Hotster, who is uh, one of the leaders in the um, uh, errors, freaks, and oddities, uh, requested that I break the sheet apart and uh, sell him part of it, but uh, I'm not quite ready to do that. Um, some of the misperfs are just amazing, and the alignments are, are quite striking. Uh, next slide, please. The next one I have is the most important or most valuable of these. There are only six supposedly known. Um, this block is imperf horizontal and vertical with perforations all around the block of four. Um, just a few years ago, this was in the Scott catalog at $3,500, actually $4,500 at one point. And I was able to buy this block for 3,500. They eventually, uh, um, the catalog shows them at 1,700 or 1,400 now, but I quit looking after that. So uh, uh, perforations are emitted while perfs all around. So I mentioned that, next slide please, that my uh, expertise is somewhat in Dorothy Knapp, uh, is in first day covers. This is my Dorothy Knapp or one of them. Uh, I also have a uh, dual combination with the forest conservation stamp and the Smoky Bear stamp. There are, um, uh, Dorothy Knapp has uh, Doug Weiss printed his book and he has a three, I think, pictured in there. This is not one that he had pictured in there. Next slide, please. For those that um, aren't as... Uh, uh, pushy as I am, you may not have a Chris Cali. This is my Chris Cali stamp or uh, cache. And um, it's definitely one of the prizes of my collection. Uh, having Chris Cali's uh, uh, 29 cent stamp uh, somewhat parodied using Smokey in the visor of the uh, um, space suit. So uh, I've got that one. Next slide, please. I was very fortunate to uh, having picked up over the years a number of different uses of this stamp. They, I, I don't know that I've seen a variety in any other uh, first day uh, cover that I've looked at or judged or have uh, just viewed at a show that had the number of varieties that were uh, that I have for this stamp. The problem is, or that I have with some of them, is I know by the name of the sender that they were philatelically contrived. Uh, if you don't know recorded delivery, it's somewhat like a, uh, uh, it, it's basically used in Europe, and it's a, um, a seldom seen type of uh, uh, use for the stamp. So with that, uh, 
I think I can go to um, the time for questions, if there are any. Okay, so I don't have any questions right now from our viewers. Uh, Rick, t t tell me a little bit more about uh, uh, the not just the the smoky stamp, but the the ephemera that goes along with it. Um, this is probably one of those top. It's one of these collecting areas where I think ephemera could be just as a meaningful for exhibiting as the stamp itself. Well, I really wish uh, when I exhibit that I had a small room to put it in because I have baseballs, I have baseball bats, I have electric trains, I have cigarette lighters, red uh, ashtrays, I have pocket knives, uh, coins, um, all of the, there were about 30 years worth of Cinderella stamps of Smokey that, that are out there. I have kites. Um, there are friends of mine. I do not have the largest Smokey Bear collection. I have 900. I did have in my home in Maryland before I moved. I had 900 square feet of my basement dedicated to Smokey Bear and everything was on exhibit. I have uh, 30 some odd uh, stuffed Smokies. I do not sleep with them. They are my friends, uh, but I uh, they take good care of me and I try to take as good a care of them. I have a 1948 talking poster of Smokey Bear. It's the old chatty Kathy pull the string box and remember only you, you can put wildfires. Um, I was able to pick up this weekend a, or a couple of weeks ago now, I guess, a um, Smokey Bear cover that was signed by Jackson Weaver, who was the first voice of Smokey Bear. And the current voice of Smokey Bear, for all you trivial people out there, trivia people, is uh, Sam Elliott. And if you check out Sam Elliott's birthday, I've already mentioned it in this talk, it's August uh, 9th, 1944, the same as the birthday given to Smokey Bear. Uh, Smokey has been a cartoon image for a number of years. I've got magazines, books, comic books. There are Dale Four Color comics. There are uh, numerous other comic books, the little March of Dimes. Um, yeah, March of Dimes uh, comic books that were given out with shoe stores uh, for kids. I've got books, blankets. Uh, yeah. So the ephemera is uh, something else. Yeah. I hope that's what you meant. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I got a comment here from our mutual friend, Foster Miller, saying, having seen your Smoky Museum, you need, you need more than a small room. <laughs> <laughs> He's right. I have a mud flap, by the way, that was uh, showed up anonymously one time in the mail. It was uh, this large flap cardboard cotton for a uh, carton for a large um, mud flap that had come off of a, I'm assuming a large forest uh, department truck and um, there was no return address nobody ever owned up to sending it to me but it's hanging in my garage right now so um, I'm still looking at my new home for a, a place to hang the smoky uh, memorabilia um, I have over th over 300 smoky bear posters that are put out uh, many states have put out um, there were national put out. There were some that were adjusted for the states. Um, I have books and books of blot, ink blotters that were used for Smokey, uh, bookmarks, uh, you name it. It's out. If you want to see it in Smokey Bear, I can find it for you. Ceramics, you name it. Okay, we're getting a lot of good questions in now. Here's one. Uh, I have a four block with 17, 17, 17 in one of the empty top blocks and three in the other top block. What does that tell you? Well, the, there's actually four numbers up there at the top. Not, uh, It's probably the yellow is just very light and hard to, hard to see, but it's the first number. And then you'll have the magenta, cyan, and yellow, and then the black will be the number three. Uh, he just commented, yes, he uh, he missed that. What uh, what is that? Does it have a meaning to it, though, I guess is the question. Um, no, it's, um, I mean, that's the last of the series that was printed 
because it was plate number 17, 17, 17, 17. And if you go back to that page that we had shown earlier that showed the plate activity report, you can look up and see that um, when those plates were used. Uh, again, I don't have all of them on here, but uh, the yellow plate was given plate number 41111, and it was actually went to press on September 6th in 1984, and it was used for 128,206 impressions. So I don't know how much more detail I can get on it, but yeah, it was uh, the last plate that was used. Well, that's a lot more information than I thought you'd have. Uh, <laughs> how, how challenging is it to find the Smokey Bear commemorative on a genuine commercial cover? Um, to find it on a genuine commercial cover is, um, I have seen, I've got boxes and boxes of them. I've got first aid covers, um, non cached I've got a um, hundred or so of those. And I'm still looking for good artists that can, um, again, if you look at the criteria that's in the exhibiting manual, exhibitor's manual, uh, judging manual, you'll find that you can use of known, well-known artist, or there's something to the verbi verbiage of that, that tells you that you can have uh, additional add-ons, but add-ons are normally not a thing that you would want in your exhibit, with the exception of, I mean, if I had Rembrandt to do one, yes, I would like to put that one in there. Uh, this is one of my favorite questions. On the Treasury Department form with, with the plate information, why is the stamp listed as Smokey V Bear with the word V? You know, there are some people that are just unknowing and they make mistakes. Government people do make mistakes. And um, I can tell you that in 1950, a law was passed, as I mentioned earlier, protecting the name and image of Smokey Bear. In that law, he was named Smokey Bear. And his image was protected not by copyright, not by trademark. His image is protected by law specifically. And when I get into a conversation, there are people that will load people with that information and have them add the word the, and then they usually jump back and allow me to present my argument. Do you, do you think that Prior to that, there was such a uh, maybe a diversity in the use of it that uh, it took some time to get V out. Even uh, even when I was a kid, and I know I'm uh, an old man, but even when I was a young man, there were ads that I had to run when I was in college uh, in the '90s uh, on on radio that uh, that focused specifically on it not being Smokey the Bear. So it seems like there was a lag in terms of understanding that. He was printed in 1950, it was protected. In 1952, a gentleman, uh, there was Rollins and Jackson, I think, that wrote a song. In order to keep the beat of the song, they added the word the. So therefore, uh, Gene Autry and a number of other people singing the anthem of Smokey Bear would allow, that allowed a whole generation to come to know him as Smokey T-Bear or whatever you want to say. But Smokey is is Smokey Bear, by law, I do have the FBI on speed dial and I will turn you in. Uh, okay, the uh, next question I have is, did you ever see the actual Smokey Bear when he was at the National Zoo? I did not see him there. Uh, Port Smokey, he went to the National Zoo in 1950. He was found on a fire in... Um, uh, Lincoln National Forest in Capitan, New Mexico. Um, the original name, you want to get into names, the original name of the bear that they found was Hotfoot Teddy. Uh, somebody said, hey, why don't we make him the living image of Smokey Bear? So the Piper Airplane Company used a Cub airplane to take the Cub Smokey to Washington, D.C. He was a fierce little fighter and uh, he um, didn't make a lot of friends along the way, but the um, they flew him to Washington, D.C., got him his own enclosure. He became a very large bear and they said, well, ooh, we better mate him so we can have Smokey forever. And uh, they brought in a bear named Goldie. 
and he and Goldie did not really get along very well. So it was in 19, um, around the early 70s, they found another bear, same forest, uh, another fire that had been orphaned. They took him to the National Zoo and he became Smokey Jr. In 1975, if you'll look at the artwork for Smokey Bear, it's him tipping his hat and he says, thanks. That's when the original Smokey from 1950 at the zoo tipped his hat and said goodbye. He went into retirement. He was there for a year. He died at the zoo. Smokey Jr. took over. Smokey Jr. died in 1990. Smokey and Smokey Jr. are both buried at the Smokey Bear State Park in Capitan, New Mexico. And their grave site are there. I have been to their grave site. It's a very reverent event for me. So, uh, yes. And if you go there, you can eat at the Smoky Bear Mo um, restaurant, stay at the Smoky Bear Motel. They're both on Smoky Bear Boulevard, right next to the Smoky Bear Museum, which is right next to the entrance to the Smoky Bear State Park. So make Capitan a stop on your next visit to New Mexico. Well, I'm not surprised one bit that you've been to, to the Smoky Bear National Park. Uh, I got I got a message from Italy. Congrats for your passion and research for a, a passionate collector of ecology stamps in Milan, Italy. Smoky items are definitely among my favorites in my collection. Thanks for this presentation. Um, I don't have any other questions pending from viewers, and I don't have any additional questions as well. Uh, any other final thoughts you want to share with us? Nope. I'd be glad to... Um, uh, Talk to anybody, um, if they ask, contact you for my uh, email address or contact information, I'll be happy to give it out. Um, and we can uh, uh, continue conversations at uh, stamp shows. I will be at, uh, my next show is in Florex at, in Orlando. Uh, I'll be judging there. I will be at um, Atlanta, um, yeah, Atlanta, Georgia for SESE, Southeastern Stamp Expo in January. Uh, I will be at the Garfield Perry show in um, uh, Ohio. So please uh, don't hesitate to come up and let's talk Smokey. So that, that does trigger one more question for me. Is there somewhere online that we can find your Smokey Bear exhibit? Uh, if not, why not? And can the APS do it for you? The APS could do it for me if they could help me figure out. I've got a a uh, four page uh, piece in there and I haven't figured out how to get it into your format. So please, I'd love to put it out there. All right. Well, that's a to be continued conversation because I absolutely would love to have that. This is a, uh, this is a great talk. Uh, Rick, I think the other question here is, would it be okay if we shared the PowerPoint presentation you did this evening? Definitely. Okay. Uh, for those folks watching, if you'll contact us, we'd be happy to share that with you. Um, I see the note here that uh, uh, that we would be uh, uh, to do it, Todd, and I'll write your name down. Um, but uh, I think that is everything for now.